we're diving into, like I said, our soul renovations theme. We've been jumping into the last couple of weeks. We're going to continue on tonight uh, into that. And the title of my message is Doctrine of Praise. Doctrine of Praise. God has given every single one of us a unique design, a unique call, a reason why we're alive. He has placed the very breath in our lungs every single day for us to be able to live out this call, this unique design in us. He, he formed us in our mother's womb. He, he gave us a, a download, a blueprint from heaven, a strategy that He's called each and, each and every one of us to be able to live out for all of our days of what He's called us to do. And He ultimately as well, He's called in partnership with this, this idea that He's called us that we wouldn't just be living in turmoil or living in pain or living in heartache or living in torment, but God's desire for us is that our soul would prosper, that our soul would prosper. He, he's designed for us to live a prosperous life, to be able to live a life of health, to be able to live a life of wholeness, not to live a life where we're stumbling our way to heaven, trying to get just get through the next day. But God is designed for us and has a desire and plan for our life that we would live prosperous even to the depths of our soul. We know this because it says in 3 John chapter 2, verse 2, Beloved, I pray, that you may prosper in all, all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. But you see, we will never have our soul renovated whilst our praise is distracted. Whilst our praise is distracted on different things of this world, we'll never be able to position our heart, position our soul to be renovated, recalibrated, as if God's doing a spiritual heart surgery on the inside out and transforming us, positioning us for all He has for us unless we position our praise in the right place. Why is this? It's because at its core, at our very DNA, at the very reason why God has created you and I, it is to praise Him. At the very reason of why we're designed, it isn't necessary to have a certain career. It isn't to necessarily have a certain university degree. It isn't necessary to have live in a certain city or live in a certain nation. Although God will call you to different aspects of that, the deeper cause of why He calls you there is that you would bring glory to Him, that you would praise Him. And whilst our praise is misdirected, then our soul can't be renovated. Our soul can't be transformed because we've got our praise on the very thing that can transform us, misdirected on different things in life. So it's not a question on if we praise, it's a question on what we praise or rather who we praise. That position in our life of do we praise the things of God and give Him glory or have we misdirected ourselves and lead us to go in this spiral and this cycle where we've let ourselves down a track where we can't seem to shake ourselves free. Point number one tonight is this, where your praise is directed, your soul is headed. Where your praise is directed, your soul is headed. Psalms 103, I love my wife read it out before. Psalms 103, verse 1 to 5, and then we'll jump forth to 11 to 13. It says, My soul, bless the Lord and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. My soul, bless the Lord and do not forget all of His benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with the faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like an eagle. That is a word for Pastor Mike today. Your youth is renewed like an eagle. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His faithful love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far He has removed our transgressions from us. As, as a father who has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. There is a beautiful passage here. And the very beginning of us sets a framework for us. The writer here in the Psalms isn't anticipating that his soul is going to lead him. In fact, the writer speaks to his very soul and says, my soul, you're gonna bless the Lord. My soul, regardless of your state, I'm gonna remind you of the testimony of what God's done in my life. 
my soul, regardless of what season I'm walking through, I'm gonna position myself to bless His holy name, to praise Him, to exalt Him, to glorify Him, no matter what it looks like. Why is this? It's because your soul was never meant to lead you. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And the reality is, is these things were never meant to cause direction in our life or lead our life. Emotions are a gift from God. They're not evil, they're not bad, but emotions are simply data, they're not direction. Emotions are simply this idea that gives us a framework or gives us an indicator on where we're at. They're not meant to be the roadmap on how to actually get out. Emotions were never meant to lead our life. So here we see in in the Psalms, Him speaking to His soul, saying, regardless of how I feel, I'm I'm gonna position my life to exalt the Name of Jesus. You know, I find two things in collaboration focuses in this Psalm. One is focused on breakthrough. The other is focused on testimony. You see, it goes deeper than simply a, obligation, thanking God at the dinner table while we're saying grace and giving praise to Him and glory to Him in that way, like thanks God for the food tonight, amen, and then you head on out. There is a deeper place of praise where we understand it's not driven out of obligation, it's not driven out of a sentiment or a homage that we just simply throw to God, but it's actually positioning our heart to be able to praise Him for the breakthrough we believe is coming, but also praise Him for the testimony of what we know He's done. So we position our life. And this is why you'll find on church on Sundays, people aren't hungry to be able to get in the room. They're not here at 5.55 early, packed room, because they, they're living their life and they don't actually know what they're believing for. They don't even know what they're believing for breakthrough for. So why would they get in the room early to praise God? Because they don't even know what they're believing for. Yet alone living a life of faith, that would actually have testimony and fruit around your world that you said, man, my week, God just moved. I'm gonna make sure I'm here at 5.55 on the dot, early in the room to praise my King for everything He's done in my world. But if you're living a life that's lacking faith, that's distant from God, then it's no wonder that you're not compelled to get an atmosphere that could praise His Name. Do you see it that our praise is deeply connected to the state of our souls? The reality is, is you don't have a pride problem. You have a praise problem. Because your problem isn't pride, it's the fact you're exalting and praising yourself over God. The reality is you don't have a spiritual hunger problem. You have a praise problem. Because what's taking place is you're exalting your comfortability, your complacency, and you're putting your praise there rather than actually put it, stepping yourself out of your comfort zone, you are to praise Jesus. The reality is you may not have an addiction here, you, but what it is is you're positioning your heart to find your satisfaction, your praise in the things of this world, into idols, into drugs, into porn. Position your life that way versus positioning your heart towards praising the King of glory. The praise is deeply connected to the state in our souls. Psalms 42.11 says this, Why my soul? Are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God. For I will still praise Him, my Saviour and my God. Where your praise is directed, that is where your soul will head. Where the direction of your praise, that is where your soul will ultimately end up. If you want a healthy soul, a prosperous soul, you need to go back to the root and ask, what am I praising in my world? This writer here in chapter 42 says this exact thing. My soul's in turmoil. My soul's dejected. I feel like I'm just beaten up. I'm bruised. But in that moment, I have an opportunity to respond in praise. I have an opportunity to respond in praise. And the Scripture says to put my hope in God, for I will still praise Him regardless of my season. You know, praise was never meant to be reserved for the Sunday service. But the Sunday service will expose your praise when you're not here. You know that uh, the, 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 the praise moment, the, the couple of minutes that we have together as we praise and we worship, 
All that is doing is indicating how your praise is gonna be tomorrow. Because I tell you what, if you're not comfortable praising God in this room, it's gonna be really difficult praising God out there. Because in this room, there's no judgment, there's acceptance. You can exalt His Name, you can lift Him, you can walk in feeling like you've had the most rubbish week. But if you can't praise Him in here, you're gonna struggle out there when you're surrounded by people who are throwing shade at you, who are pushing you down, who are rejecting you. These are the moments we can come together to stir our faith where our praise is directed. There your soul is headed. Psalms, how do we do this? What's the paradigm shift? Psalm 115 verse one says this, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your faithful love and because of your truth that in order for us to position our hearts to praise Him, not let idols, addictions, lusts of this world, things that we're trying to pursue, trying to exalt above His Name, the way to continually position our heart to praise Him in every season is when our agenda isn't focused on us getting the glory, when our agenda isn't focused on what can I get? What blessing can I get? When do I get recognised? When do I get the privileges? When it's totally focused on, man, how do I give God all the glory for my life? We position ourselves to be able to give Him all the glory and never take it. You know, in the Bible, there are seven Hebrew names for the word praise, seven different names. And these names indicate different variations or version of how we actually praise God. Each one of these, a ancient culture within the Jewish culture that they understood that these different types of praising builds different spiritual formation in your life and allows you to praise Him with your entire life. Seven uh, Hebrew names of praise. The first one is Toda. This speaks about a sacrificial praise, a praise that actually costs you something. There is a deepening when we praise God that it should actually cost you something. It says in Hebrews that we had to bring Him a sacrifice of praise, that our praise should cost us something. It should be worth something that we can lay at the altar. It should actually be an investment of saying, hey God, You've done so much for me and now I'm willing to lay my life down for You in praise. The other one is, the, sorry, the, the second name is Yada which pray, this praise is an expression of surrender. This one literally speaks about when we lift our hands. It speaks about the literal lifting of hands and praising the King of glory. The, the, the name Yahweh speaks about the hands and the lifting of hands. This one speaks about lifting of hands and the expression of surrendering. It's, it's showing that the internal praise that we're giving God is impacting our outward posture. And actually, as we lift our hands and praise the King, the third name is Barak. This means that the praise that blesses God in action. This word is the most common word that we find in the Old Testament when it's speaking about praise. It's the most common and every time it's used, it's used as a verb. It's never used as a noun. It's never used as a theory. It's never talking about uh, something internal in the spirit realm. It's talking about a physical action that you'll do with your body that will bring praise to Him. The craziest thing about this word is it's most commonly used in two places. One, when it's speaking about us blessing God, and then two, when it's speaking about God blessing us. You realise that God is an adornment God in heaven. He is a God of action. He is a God that wants to bless you, actually move in your world when you lift up and exalt His Name. This is what this means. The fourth name is, is um, Shabbat, which this simply means to shout in the context where, you know, you may have seen in services, maybe in a lead moment or in a moment where the worship lead is leading us, this moment is literally saying to lift a shout of praise. So this idea when we lift our voices and shout out towards Jesus, this isn't just like a Pentecostal hype beast, how do we get the, the crowd going type moment. This is literally an ancient culture in Scripture where the Jews understood, when I shout and lift my praise to the King of glory, I know that I'm gonna be able to encounter Him and bring breakthrough to my life. We should get up here next Sunday, Pastor Lim, and say, hey, lift a shout of Shabbat. So we should do. 
All the Jews would understand. All the English people would be confused. The fifth name is Zama. This one literally speaks about praise that's coming from music or singing or songwriting and that glorifies God. So, so writing music, actually bringing music out in song and in moments like our Sunday service or if you're in your bedroom at home or driving in your car and you've got praise music on and you're worshiping King. This is actually a position where you're building that spiritual formation in your life and you're, you're engaging with an ancient culture in the God that we serve that's creating music that's coming out of you and actually glorifying God. The sixth one is halal, which this one speaks about praise that raves, makes a show, it boasts, it dances unto the Lord because of tremendous excitement towards God and all that is done. This is the root word and intrinsically connected to the word hallelujah. This word here is literally when you're in maybe like one of the rows here tonight and there was that creepy person three, three, three seats across you who was jumping up and down and running in circles and going a bit crazy. That person ain't crazy. They're worshipping God with their entire life. They're worshipping God with their entire being, giving praise to the King. This is what this word means. It even speaks about boasting, almost showing off, dancing with the tremendous excitement of what God's doing in your life. And the seventh name is Tehillah. Oh, OP17's coming out hard. <laughs> Tehillah. <laughs> Amen. We're on an ATAR system now, so I just need to, I need to bury it in the grave and rise up as a new man, you know? Shakarabundi. <laughs> Shirakaraba. Sorry. I'm speaking tongues on the mic, someone will get me in trouble. I'm just kidding. That's for the haters. <laughs> this last one, this name speaks about, it's kind of like a summary of all the praises. It's a summary of all of them together that tonight, some of you may not have even realised, but you're engaging with this idea where you were, you were lifting your hands, you were jumping up and down. You were, you, were, you, were, you were engaging, not being led by your emotions that you're tired from the week, not being led by your emotions that you're worried about what the person next to you thinks, but you're going, you know what? I don't care about what anyone else thinks about me. I don't care about whether I'm feeling tired. I'm gonna jump up and down. I'm gonna lift my hands. I'm gonna praise the King of glory with all my being. I wanna give Him everything I got because He's worthy of our praise. You know, we had a... One of our incredible interns was sharing a testimony the other week um, just in class where we're kind of talking around this conversation of what does it mean to, to live your life to God, live a life that's, that ultimately praises Him in every avenue and facet of your life, that we just live as a life laid down, that we can give Him glory in everything that we do. And she was sharing a testimony of her grandparents, that they were missionaries overseas. <coughs> <coughs> And they found themselves um, at church on the Sunday morning, praising God, exalting Him, um, laying down their life, giving, leaving nothing on the altar, just giving everything to Him so they could be filled again, to be able to go out and do God's mission, God's work for that week. And um, they, were, they were missionaries in this country, like I said, and what was actually taking place was there was some local in the area, Satanists, who were surrounding the church and planning to raid it and attack it and try and attack them, potentially try and cause serious physical harm, potentially try and even take them out, all these kind of things. They were starting to surround actually where the church was. And they, the only thing they knew how to do was to continue to praise God. Because they go, man, if this is the day my life ends or if God's got more days on this earth for me, I want to till the very last moment be glorifying and praising the King of glory with everything that I am. And they had this deep conviction. And as they were praising, the story goes that the Satanists that were surrounding them looked at the church and they saw the angels surround the church and in this moment, they saw them and they, they realised in this moment, because of their praise and because of who they worship, we can't touch them. And in that moment, they were totally made away because of their praise. Can we give praise to the King of glory? He's so, so good. Maybe clap again so I can have a drink. You're very compliant, very obedient. 
That's good. I appreciate that. I didn't even tell you to do that. You just, that's leadership. You're just leading. It's good. There we go, eh? It's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. It says this. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. And a response to that, this is what the verse says. So glorify Him with your body. In other words, allow yourself to step into this place where your entire body, body, soul, spirit, praises the King of glory, allows Him to bring breakthrough and testimony of life and transform you from the inside out. You know, Christ probably knew more than anyone, we can confidently say, what it meant to live sacrificially, bringing glory to God sacrificially laying his life down with his entire self, his body, his soul and his spirit, giving praise to the King. He probably knew it better than anyone, modelled it better than anyone, showed us what it meant to actually live sacrificially with his life. And there's a moment where we see one of the greatest moments of praise take place on what we know as the cross of Calvary. In this moment, we find it in Matthew 27, 46. Jesus had been pierced. He'd been broken. He'd been bruised. He'd been beaten. He'd been pierced on His side. He had nails in His wrists and His feet. He had the crown of thorns on. His entire body was in a state where He was totally, the Scriptures say, in almost a place where He was unrecognisable that if you knew Him face to face, you wouldn't be able to recognise Him. That's how badly beaten He was. And in this moment, we see in Matthew sorry, 27, this famous phrase where Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This great moment where God was prophetically, sorry, Jesus was prophetically speaking into what was about to take place. That in this moment of suffering, this moment of turmoil, where his soul was a a, a total torment, where he was just getting beaten in his body, in this place, he gave praise to the King. But in this moment, there are many interpretations of this passage where Jesus says, My God, why have you abandoned me? Some translators say, why have you forsaken me? There is different interpretations where we think about this Scripture and we think this was the one moment in history where Christ was separate from God and God had turned away from Him. And because of the sin that He was carrying, He was totally separate from God. But if we follow that train of thought, we get a bit down a sketchy path theologically where we start to question whether is that saying that the Trinity, the one that's in perfect unity, the one that we know, can at any one point be separated? Or are they truly, do we believe that the Trinity is a three in one God? It follow, if we follow this path the nuts, it gets us into a place of almost like a polytheistic idea where we start to think not that God is three in one, but rather He's actually three separate gods and that it's Jesus, it's the Son, it's the Father and the Holy Spirit, but it's not three in one. It's a dangerous road when we follow that. Another interpretation of this passage is this idea that um, almost in a noble way, God was so couldn't bear the thought or or even look at Jesus in that state that he couldn't help but turn away and separate from him. And it was the one moment because of the sin he was carrying that he was separate from him because he couldn't bear to look at him. He couldn't bear to turn away. And this is a noble thought because we can preach it. We can teach it. We can say this idea that, hey, whenever you felt like God isn't with you, Jesus has experienced that too. But we don't see this here. Because what we see is Jesus, when He said, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? He wasn't just coming up with a Hebrew phrase in that moment. In fact, He was quoting Scripture. On the cross, He was quoting Psalms 22, 
When you understand Psalms 22, you understand that this whole passage is a passage that speaks about that although I'm suffering right now, this is gonna be led into praise and victory. Although I'm in a moment where I'm in pain right now, I know that God is gonna lead me to praise. You see in that moment on the cross, as Jesus felt totally beaten, it wasn't a case where God had left him, but in fact, He was prophesying every Jewish person Every person who'd read this, every scholar, everyone who'd read the Word in that time would have known exactly what Jesus was quoting. And He was quoting in this moment, Psalms 22, saying, you know what? Although this looks like suffering right now, this is about to end in praise. Although this feels like pain right now, I know that God is about to bring victory in my world. This is encouraging news because this shows us that regardless of maybe the torment or the turmoil, or the pain that you're going through. Jesus on the cross that day knows exactly what you're going through. And He wants to say that you can stand in agreement with Him tonight and say, you know what? Although I feel like I'm in suffering right now, God's gonna bring me through to victory. He's gonna bring me through to praise and God's gonna fulfill the promise on my life. Psalms 150 verse six says this, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. My last point is who we praise, we agree with. And who we agree with determines our reality. You know, the entry point to the presence of anyone is your awareness of them standing next to you or standing in front of you. That right now there's a couple of hundred of us here tonight, but you're only aware of a few of them. You're only aware of maybe the people within your direct uh, circumference or, 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 or some or a friend you know who's sitting here tonight. Although there's people in the room, because if you're not aware of them, you have no idea they're sitting here. It works the same with our praise, that whatever we praise, we're coming into agreement with and our awareness opens up to it. And when our awareness opens up to it, it allows our reality to totally transform and shift. This works on two levels. It means that when we're praising idols, when we're praising ourselves, when we're praising things of this world, our reality is totally defined by those things. But when we praise the King of glory, when we lift up His Name, when we exalt Him in everything that we're doing, when we jump up and down, we lift our hands, when we push ourselves out of this place of comfortability, complacency, and allow ourselves to praise His Name, God comes and encounters from the inside out. And even if we feel suffering, even if we feel pain, God wants to encounter us and have a soul renovation tonight through our praise as we redirect it towards Him. Is it possible that tonight you could be in the same room as King Jesus, your breakthrough, but you're only aware of your problem? Is it possible that right now you could be in the very room of the one who can save your soul, but you're only aware of your addiction? Is it possible that you could be in the same room right now as the very one, Christ Jesus, who gave His life for you and I, that you could live in total freedom, but you're only aware of maybe that guy or that girl or what are you doing tomorrow? Your head's in other places. You're totally distracted for what God wants to pour out on your life right now. I wonder if, is it possible that we could be in the same room, but we're only aware of our scepticism, we're only aware of our unbelief, our criticism. And we keep blaming the church. Oh, I'm getting nothing out of it. Ah, oh, the teaching isn't deep enough. Ah, oh, that preacher has way too many blowouts in his preach. We're so aware of our scepticism, our unbelief, our criticism. That King Jesus is in the room and He wants to meet you. Even if you're on fire for God, He wants to just deepen that at a whole nother level. Shift the trajectory of your life. Give you a soul renovation. Make your soul prosper. If we're only aware of this and that, we're distracted. I wonder if there's anyone here tonight who would begin to just adjust our awareness, even right now, 
just our awareness onto Him. And in this moment, the prison cells would break open in our heart. The chains would begin to fall off. Bodies would begin to get healed. Those generational curses that have been bonding us would lift off us. That demonic oppression that's been tormenting our dreams and our nightmares would break off us. That we have an undeniable encounter with Him as we praise His Name. If we could all close our eyes, that'd be amazing. Hey, maybe you're here for the very first time and you're still sussing this whole deal out. And you're like, ah, oh, man, this is my first time in church or even the first time hearing about the name Jesus, the one that wants to set me free, the one that wants to bring soul renovation on the inside. Or maybe you've been coming a long time, maybe you've been called City Point Home, maybe you're one of the fans. But if you ask yourself right now this very important question, do I know Jesus? Do I know the one that can set me free? That I don't have to live in bondage anymore. I don't have to live with my soul in turmoil anymore. But I can live totally free. If the answer to that question is, you know what, to be honest, Chris, I, I don't know him. If I'm real, he's not my best friend. Or maybe you used to know him, but you feel distant from him. He feels like you just can't engage anymore. Your life is with bondage. You've been wrestling with different stuff. You've got different stuff going on in your world that's been distracting you, consuming you, leading you down wrong paths. And you know, man, my praise hasn't been on Him. It's been on a whole bunch of different stuff. But tonight's the night that you say, yeah, this is for me. I wanna praise the King glory. I wanna give Him all my praise. I wanna make a decision right now. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row. You don't have to have like everything sorted in your life. You just have to say yes. You just have to say yes to Him. And He'll come, the Holy Spirit will come and dwell on the inside of you and begin to do a precious, powerful, amazing work that will transform your life. If that's you and you wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, whether it's for the first time, as a recommitment, or you're not totally sure you're saved, but you wanna be sure. The Bible says we can be confident on our salvation. You're not totally sure you're saved. That you know what, you don't know what tomorrow brings, but you wanna know no matter what you're gonna walk through, Jesus is gonna be with you. If that's you on the count of three, you wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, whether for the first time or a recommitment, on the count of three, I just want you to be really brave and shoot up your hand on the count of three. One, two, three, shoot up your hands. Incredible decision, amazing decision. Amazing decision down the front, bro, incredible. Amazing decision in the middle. Amazing, 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 incredible decision. Come on, is there anyone else that look from left to right? Shoot it really high, I don't wanna miss this. Yeah, amazing in the back, two hands in the back, incredible decision, amazing decisions. Come on, is there anyone else? Shoot it really high. Shoot it really high as I look one last time from left to right. This is the most important decision you'll ever make. This decision determines every other decision you make from here on in. Come on, I don't wanna miss it from left to right. If that's you, just shoot it up really brave. Just one more person. If that's you, God's beating on your heart. You know this is for you. You don't wanna miss this. You don't wanna miss this. Incredible, incredible. Amazing decision in the back. That's incredible, amazing. And Father, we thank You so much, God, for every decision. God, they weren't light ones. God, but even right now, Your Holy Spirit will come and rest on the inside of them. God, even sense that maybe ones or twos who shot up their hand, whether they didn't get the whole way up. God, they can resonate with the idea that their soul's been in turmoil. Right now, Father, we thank You that salvation is a, is a transformational, holistic salvation that transforms us from the inside out. And right now, Father, we thank You that Your Holy Spirit is coming to rest upon them. God, the old is gone and the new is come. God, the distractions of this world will be no longer and they'll be able to praise the King of glory. Come on, can we celebrate every decision 